Hello and welcome back to another Disruptive Life podcast. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about music or scores or sound, but not like sound effects, like music sound. It can be diegetic or it can be non-diegetic. Grace. Yes. Um, you go. Start. You start. <laughs> you go. <laughs> I thought, let's get Lord of the Rings out of the way. I wasn't going to talk about Lord of the Rings. Let's get... Well, okay. you not? I will. I will. I'm oh. going to get that later. We'll talk about Eventually. how it uses. Oh, we got I mentioned it in a previous one. I've kind of said it all that it uses Wagner style light motifs. I can link you to a really good YouTube video that explains it in more detail. No thanks. Um, no, I was going to talk about the 60s. Um, in the 60s, if you watch <laughs> the 1560s, <laughs> in the 50s and 60s, there's a lot of films by one Alfred Hitchcock, um, Rear Window, Vertigo things like that, uh, Psycho. And there's a guy who did all the music for all of those was a guy called Bernard Herrmann. And he does fantastic scores. But his best score, in my mind, was for 1976's Taxi Driver, which is just so good. That's what I want to talk about. It's just so good. I love the music in that film. It's basically just jazz trumpet. Mm. And it sort of captures the feel of this late night driving. And you get this sort of voiceover by Travis Bickle. And it's just... I don't remember the music from that film. How? It's like the one the biggest part... I don't know. I just didn't when when we were thinking about music. I didn't really didn't really pop in my head that um, Taxi Driver had music in it. Oh, you suck. Obviously it does, but yeah, I don't know what popped into your head when we when we thought let's do a music one when you had the idea. So many things. So many. You like. Uh, oh God, where to start? I was thinking. Right, let's go one. Let me just rattle off one, yeah. two specific people: John Williams and Hans Zimmer. For just I don't know, camera's eyes light up. Uh, there, there's a point I want to get to. I'll get to in a bit about those two. Like I love <laughs> about those two. Like those two. they're great oh, at film soundtracks mm. and just like creating. I think themes more specifically because theme tunes are great for distinguishing. Films like you know, like you think of Star Wars, you think of the theme tune, like all so those. You've not even seen Star Wars, mm-hmm. and you hear that you know yeah, exactly, yeah, you I hear do, the Star yeah. Wars theme, yeah, the and you're like, ooh, Star yeah. Wars. And uh, obviously, John Williams did Harry Potter, and those are very specific things that trigger like your brain to think of those things and all the emotions you felt watching those films, right? Which is such like an important thing. But then, like me and Cameron spoke about this before. That's great. Films that don't, like franchises that don't have a specific theme end up kind of just getting lost because they're Mm. great, but you lose that emotional response Mm -hmm. to music. And I think like, I always say that I love listening to film soundtracks after I've watched it because like you remember the emotional response you had watching it to that music. The music is tied to the catharsic response. So your brain, you just get a sort of, Redose of that. I mean, I, I'm gonna say it. Whenever I hear the concerning Hobbit soundtrack, all of that feeling I had when I was younger and the comfort of that, it yeah. comes from that. You said this before with Star Wars. Yeah. That when that's, as soon as you were speaking about a soundtrack, in my head was the concerning Hobbit thing. Was it? It's, <laughs> the it's the best. It's so, so good. It's like, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No. Hundred percent. I think, and I think as we were, we've talked about before, that I think that um, the Avengers really lacks that. I think it, there's, there's no the Avengers theme. I can't hum it. Like if I hear it, I'm like, oh yeah, it's the Avengers theme. But that didn't really come around until later anyway. Yeah. And like, there's no Thor doesn't have a theme, and you go, oh, that's Thor's theme. And it would be really easy to do it with their sort of cross film universe to then suddenly, you know, in uh, in pff, End Game where all the portals show up and all the dead people come back. Mm. Yeah. During that, if you suddenly heard their themes before they showed up, but then when I don't want them to do it, halfway through Doctor Strange, Patrick Stewart comes rolling in in his little space wheelchair, yeah. and he's just like, I don't. And that was like, um, it's good to have like a theme tune to go with the character. But then yeah. I think Wonder Woman as well. Every time she was on screen, it was the the Wonder Woman little yeah. bit. <laughs> which was really annoying. Really annoying. But that's also just an unpleasant piece of music anyway. But also with the, the annoying one with Patrick Stewart as well is that's not the X-Men theme from the movies particularly. And they also haven't done X-Men in the MCU yet. So then you're referencing something that's, they're referencing the cartoon, the X-Men cartoon, which is a totally different piece of media, a totally different universe, totally different set of stories and characters. It's a weird kind of just tip of the hat to the fans that's really it's really jarring during that film. 
yeah, yeah. They, they they fell massively into that anyway just being like oh remember this piss book different conversation we've already spoken about this how nostalgia whatever yeah. whatever um oh i was just gonna say something and then i rambled and i forgot best thing about john williams is that in the 60s 50s and 60s bernard herman did a lot of scores for a lot of films and he did all of those scores with a lot of strings obviously psycho and then taxi driver has strings but it's also then got a lead saxophone to give it a kind of jazzy feel but that was 1976 and then in the same year and also 1976 john williams did jaws and Jaws is obviously a totally different kind of film, but that big sort of very iconic theme. And in 77, he did um, Star Wars. 79, he did Superman, then did Raiders, E.T., Close Encounters, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Harry Potter. But then around the same time that he was doing Harry Potter, Hans Zimmer then came out and went, I'm going to do... He'd already done The Lion King and a couple of other things, but he did Rain Man as well, I think, but but it's, which is all synths, which is kind of a different soundtrack. But... He did Gladiator, which I think is the sort of um, iconic Hans Zimmer sound with the sort of, he's got a choir and there's lots of strings, but there's also, it's very much a sort of understated sound. Not There's no big themes that are like, bam, 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 which is what all of John Williams stuff is. And it's kind of, I know people love John Williams. I can't stand his stuff. Like it's so, I really? like it's fine for when I was 10, but now I'm just like, oh, just get rid of the, bloody brass so much of it it's so loud i hate raiders of the lost ark anyway as a film mm. having to hear that music just annoys me so much the only one i really like is superman because i really like superman's character i like the film i like all of that and star wars is fine but then fine it's fine john williams has been able to prove that he's able to do really good stuff outside of his little microcosm Schindler's List for example the soundtrack that's incredible uh, Lincoln which I mentioned in a previous podcast is one of my favourite films ever made and his soundtrack that is so good um, and uh, Revenge of the Sith his soundtrack that is so not very Star Wars-y particularly when Anakin turns on the Jedi spoilers um, during Order 66 there's this really sad kind of I think it's called Anakin's Betrayal oh yeah and it's really good but and they will get mowed down they will get killed spoilers for you but whatever yeah that is actually I forgot yeah. about that one yeah the real slow one when it's just everything's super duper sad and depressing but now Hans Zimmer's the guy right Hans Zimmer does everything he does all of the Nolan films which are some of the biggest films every year he does the DC films he did um the Dark Knight films he then also which is obviously Nolan then he also did Batman versus Superman Man of Steel, he's done, um, he seems to have, and then recently he just did Dune, which was so good. His soundtrack, that was so good. Use of instrumentation and stuff, like, there's a lot, because one of the things they said when they went to make that film was, this is humanity in 8,000 years time, that they would have instruments unrecognizable to our ears, so that he mixed synths and done sort of synthetic instruments in a really, really, really weird way, to make these odd sounds, but the one thing that's constant is the human voice. But they don't speak English, obviously, because it's 8,000 years future. And there's a lot of sort of guttural throat singing and stuff and really kind of odd sounds that give it this very kind of alien feel. But doesn't make it feel science fiction. You know when you watch like rubbish 50s science fiction? And they have this kind of soundtrack, which is horrible. <laughs> but then the question then is who's going to define soundtracks going forward? Yeah. How old are they? Those They're guys? all... Bernard Herman's dead. Mm. John Williams, a million. Yeah. And uh, Handsome of sort of mid late 60s, I think. Yeah. So, who do you think is next? I like Ludwig Goranson a lot. I think he's someone who's done some really cool stuff. He did Tenet, um, oh, okay. which was very much a Hans Zimmer clone, but it was a real kind of like step forward from that. Uh, he also did The Mandalorian, which mm. again is a very different, he uses really odd instrumentation, which I really like. He also does pop music as well at the same time. So he's very, he's quite young, he's probably like 30. Uh, he also did the music of Black Panther, which is a film I didn't enjoy, but I loved the music from it. So the soundtrack, the soundtrack, this, the score, he did that. Yeah, okay, fine. I was going to say, because if he, produced but again, like I don't, I have no idea. I also thought Johan Johansson might be someone who would do it. Uh, he did, the, he did the music for a lot of Denis Villeneuve stuff. He did Sicario, Prisoners, um, Enemy, and Arrival. And Arrival had a really interesting soundtrack. Uh, but he unfortunately died a couple of years ago. Oh. So, oh. not going to be him. Glad for him. Yeah, what did you say? Ludwig 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 Goran, uh, Lud Ludwig, Ludwig Goranson? Lud oh. He's Swedish. I could tell. And then the glorious Icelandic Johan Johansson. What a name. Yeah, yeah, I think those sort of scores are good. I mean, John Williams and... Um, 
Hans Zimmer. Hans, Hans Zimmer, yeah. Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer, however you say it. I love the Inception one. I love the Inception one. Specifically, like, the, the one that's called Time at the end. That's so good. I love Such that a good one. Song. That is the best one that I think he's ever done. It's so, like, subtle and understated. And, like, it doesn't... It, weird for, weirdly for me, that doesn't apply to the film, as we were saying earlier. You know how it reminds you of the film? Instead, that sort yeah. of just fits whatever f- time I'm in. Like, I remember doing a lot of just... I'd be writing an essay at uni, like, 3 a.m., and I put that on, and I got all kind of emotional writing this, like, essay, and it was, like, just sort of... It's got it's such a big... It's very emotive. Mm. And then the music he also wrote for um, Interstellar for a guy who played it all on the organ. None of that was synthesized. It was all played by a real guy on the organ in London. It's just incredible. That is a good soundtrack. I think, yeah, you need a soundtrack because thinking about, like, um, what's that film... The, oh, the, the Hunger, Hunger Games. Games. The Hunger Games. <laughs> like I, I don't think of any music when I think about those films. There's a mm. person whistling that I think. Yeah, of. but that's yeah. not. Yeah, but that's but that's, that's yeah. diegetic, yeah, that's, that's right? It. That's actually yeah. in the thing. Diegetic, exactly. Nice. Sometimes, yeah. Well, I, I can't think of like when I think of Harry Potter. Obviously, it's the, the mm, theme tune. Yeah, the theme tune. But then, yeah, for the Hunger Games, it was trying to be like that next thing. I don't think of any. Same as like Divergent and stuff. Maze yeah. Runner. I don't know any of those songs from that one maybe they did have them maybe they were good maybe I just didn't listen to them but I think a good song really does complement I think it solidifies um, a place in your mind for mm-hmm. the franchise like even if you're not thinking about it the moment someone says Star Wars you think of the theme like it's one of those like things that you just tie together and then the next step is to then break down the film into sections into characters themes locations so you can then create music for each of those like Everyone knows the Star Wars theme, but also everyone knows the Imperial March, which is a which is a very specific. It's a theme for a character, and it, everyone knows it. Yeah. And as we were saying earlier with Lord of the Rings, that Lord of the Rings has a Rohan theme, uh, a Lothlorien theme, uh, the Fellowship theme, the Ring has a theme, the Hobbits have a theme, and they all play throughout, and it works so well. And I think, and Game of Thrones does it as well. Ramajwadi's score for all eight seasons of Game of Thrones and the House of the Dragon. Um, Winterfell has a theme. The Targaryens have, have a theme. The Greyjoys have a theme, and it all, when you hear it, you can then do a lot with the melody. So if it's a very triumphant moment, you do big instrumentation, lots of instruments, lots of drums, lots of brass. But then when spoilers, Ned dies, the Winterfell theme plays, but it's just a sort of single cello, I think, and it's really quite emotive and mm. it's really good. Yeah, I think when you have like a, a, a specific theme, it's I, th- I like is as like a little reminder of who I'm watching at that yeah. very moment. Cause you know, they've, they've cut to some guy. I don't remember his name. I don't even think I it's hear a little thing. And it's like, Oh yeah, I'm in this area. I don't think it's a reminder so much as it's just a, it reinforces it. Cause it's like, they mean the same thing. No, but it's, an, it's I don't forget who the character I is. I do. <laughs> You're an idiot. Whereas like, it just reinforces the tone, the feeling. And then also it's, it's almost like it, the theme is a face. And then this, how much mu- the way you're playing the music is the facial expression. So it's like whether or not they're happy, sad, angry, emotive, but it's all still that same person. And you're able to tell a lot with just that, with that just one melody. All right. Love that. <laughs> Swiftly moving on. Yeah, I guess well, you're looking fine. at me. Yeah, well, I was going to, yeah, let's, you got anything else? Yeah, you know I do. Go. Um, so, found music Ye. in film. Um, so like Fine. the things that I was that came to mind like when I was thinking about this is like songs that remind you very specifically of films. So like for example, The Breakfast Club and Don't You, uh, Pulp Fiction, You Never Can Tell, Fight Club, Where Is My Mind. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously like those songs now when I hear them, I think of the scenes from those films and those like they're tied forever mm. like in my brain to those moments. And I feel like if you can find the right song for like a very specific moment, it then becomes the song from Pulp, Hi- Pulp Fiction and the song from Fight Club. And obviously I'm just going to keep mentioning Fight Club. And yeah, no, I know. No, I, I, I get that. I think... Um, You're breaking the rule of Fight Club. I think Tarantino is like, you know, he's the sort of king of that. But also then there's sort of multi layers of it. Um, I always think about Django Unchained, right? So Django Unchained has a lot of music by Ennio Morricone in it, who did a lot of the music. F- so he's got scores from different spaghetti westerns in his film. So he's co- stealing almost entire sections 
from those films, so it's those films and taking the music. But then also there's, because it's Django Unchained's a story uh, about a black guy, right? So there's a lot of black culture and a lot of black identity in it. So there's, uh, John Legend has a song in it, but then there's a song that's um, James Brown mashed up with a Tupac song. And then Rick Ross has a song in it as well. So it's this, it's this Western set in the 1850s, yet it's got Western's music, 70s music, 90s music and 2020s music but all sort of black music from those eras and it really kind of helps sell the identity of it feeling like a modern film taking 70s film of things about an 1850s thing it's a real kind of anachronistic film mm. yeah I love, I love that Oops, sorry. Uh, birds of prey actually does that as well all the music in that soundtrack is by women and obviously it's a film about yeah women coming together and like forming alliances and like that was something that i was like oh that's such a nice like little touch like it kind of brings that identity out it's like this is a a film about strong women so mm. it's yeah. about it's about that musical voice coming through and like it going back to scores in gladiator uh, hans zimmer wrote the whole score and that's a film entirely about dudes like that and there are so few women in that film but the the film is all about a woman in a way, in that uh, his cat, his wife, and his child are murdered, and it's about his vengeance for his wife. So in the main theme, uh, now we are free. There's um, a single uh, sort of uh, female singer over the top, and that's supposed to represent uh, his her voice in his mind throughout. So he's constantly remembering her, and it's her voice flowing through all of his actions. Mm. And the whole story, and I love that. Yeah, I think the the first Black Panther did the same as Birds of Prey. Obviously, not women, but like mm. c they were all very much black artists mm -hmm. yeah. um, who did the entire, not the score, but obviously the the sound. The soundtrack, yeah, yeah. That's, so I think that's. It's and also, Louis Garrison, who did the score, is someone who's worked with people like Childish Gambino. Mm. So he's very much recognised among hip hop and among sort of black music as a whole. Yeah, yeah. I think. A, a good scene needs a nice little song to it. I was, we spoke about this yesterday. Um, the Kingsman Secret Service, the church scene with oh yeah, uh, Leonard Skinner's Freebird. Hmm. Uh, that's great because hmm. I feel like the scene on its own, just like an action, uh, it's like an action film, action scene, you know. But then with the music, it's it's so good. Freebird's also an interesting song because Freebird doesn't have a persistent tempo. Freebird's tempo increases as the song goes on, and the fight scene's tempo increases as it matches the song. It's it's clever. Mm, yeah, I I love that, yeah. and I think about that every time I hear that song. I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, and another, another film I think that does uh, like things like that really well is um, Baby Driver. The so obviously the music and that is important anyway because it's important to the character. But I feel like. Uh, the songs match the tempo of the story really well. Obviously, when um, they do that bank robbery that goes wrong, that song's so fast-paced, you know? Yeah. And same when, uh, right at the end, when he crashes the car and then they all go on a run. Those are, like, really fast songs, but then there are times when they're, like, slower songs or, like, uh, fun songs, that very opening scene where he's just, like, having fun and yeah. waiting in the car. That song's so... Yeah. It, it mirrors his emotions really well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think most things... Was that was Edgar right? It wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Loads of stuff. Like, whatever he does, it normally has, like, good music within it yeah. to go along with I also it. enjoy things that feel like they should be found music, but aren't. So, like Scott Pilgrim, that music's all original, but it feels... None of, it doesn't feel like a score or anything. It's, like, a real kind of... But that also, you couldn't... It would be weird to describe that film as a musical. Yeah. It's got unique songs made for it. Um... But the other thing I really like is particularly in like fantasy films and historical films is developing the world building with the music. So having diegetic songs sung by people in the in the thing. So either in like The Hobbit when they sing that song about the Lonely Mountain in uh, Bag End or in Game of Thrones. You know, like Ed Sheeran shows up in Game of Thrones, right? Oh, yeah. Right. It's a weird scene, but actually the song he sings, I think is really good because it's sort of, it's exactly the kind of folk songs that if those people were real, that they would have sung, that that would exist for them. At the end when Podrick sings uh, the Jenny of Old Stones or at the beginning when they all sing the Reigns of Castamere, like these things work so well to really flesh out the universe. And I love things like that. And then again in uh, Lincoln, there's an old um, Civil War war song that once the bill gets passed, they all just start singing it about Johnny Rebel and 
all that kind of stuff. And it really kind of fleshes out that these are real people. It's a real world they live in. And just like us, they would have music and the music helps just develop the time, develop the characters. Yeah, I feel like I always get surprised when people just start randomly singing in a film that I didn't think was a musical. But yeah, I do I do like it. I was thinking of also like um, the Witcher TV show. They have yeah. that. They have a specific guy 100%. who's a... a Bard, or whatever they call them. Yeah, where Dandelion's so good. Yeah, where he just goes and sings songs about what they've just done. And Burn like Butcher that. Burn and Toss Coin to Witcher are both bangers. Yeah, they it's not the best show, but both those songs are pure bops. Yeah. Love those songs. Yeah. Also, I was thinking the other day about uh, Logan and the end song from that film, the Johnny Cash song. Is it her? No. Oh, that was around. in the trailer. Oh, it was hurt in the trailer, around. wasn't it? Yeah. That's such a good one because I feel like it captures the whole ending great. Also, I feel like credit songs in general are important. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't want to just like finish a film and then boom, there's just a pop song playing that doesn't relate to anything. I think it's really interesting who you speak to about that because I really like a pop song in the credits. It's not a pop song per se, but I really like Icy Fire by Ed Sheeran at mm. the end of the second Hobbit yeah. film because it's written for the film, but it's a pop song. But I speak to people who, I'm thinking my dad's generation, and they're like, I'm so sick of that. Because every film in the 90s ended with like um, Armageddon ends, and I don't want to miss a thing by Aerosmith plays. And I think people got really sick of it because it happened a lot. So then films started to end with scores, and then it became okay to start bringing them back. Like in Beowulf, um, Robin Wright sings a couple of songs, these are sort of old folk songs. Uh, one, one of them's called A Hero Comes Home, and it's so good. And then at the end of it, Adina Menzel, who sings um, Let It Go in Frozen, mm -hmm. she did a sort of rock cover of it, or rock version of it, and that plays in the end credits. And I love that so much. And things like that. I thought, if I made a film, it would end with a big ori original pop song. Yeah, And I, I love that. But a lot of people really don't. A lot of people think it's really like original. Played out. If it's an original song, I like it more. But if it's just, oh, this is a this popular moment. Let's put this in the credits just so it goes through then I like it less. I like it to be an original the, thing. The most recent Thor ended with a, I want to say it ended with a rainbow song. And I think we just stayed in the cinema because the speakers were so good. And there were only like 10 people. I just belted out every word of it, just full belt, because you never get to hear rainbow songs on a good sound system. And I was like, just the only, I was just having such a good time. I was on my own, <laughs> just mental, just screaming in the cinema. Yeah, the it's whole well Thor thing really tried to go with the, soundtrack but they got, they tried to copy that from guardians because yeah. guardians did it so well yeah and then thor was like oh we're gonna do it too but with slightly rockier tunes yeah. and it's like you have this film has no identity yeah, we're just gonna play thunderstruck over and over yeah, again and, um, immigrant song as well yeah, by Led Zeppelin. Just thinking yeah. Immigrant song. oh yeah that's the one they it's a bit on the nose yeah. as well because that song's about, about vikings yeah. it's a yeah. bit like all right come on yeah it's like playing Iron Man by Black Sabbath. Yeah. Iron Man's opening tune. That's why I always like, think when he shows up, they should always play Paranoid and War Pigs and never actually play Iron Man yeah. just to annoy people. Yeah. When they, well, yeah, they did do, what was the one? Well, yeah, they, no, they had ACDC do yeah. the soundtrack to Iron yeah. Man. Yeah. Uh, Shoot to Thrill and Thunderstrike and a yeah. hundred others. It would have sounded weird if it was just. Oh, yeah. Iron Man's also a really slow tune. Yeah. It doesn't really fit the vibe. I love Iron Man. I love and that also, album. But, but towards the end, it's like Iron Man. Killing the people because yeah. he's no longer a hero. So yeah. it'd be a bit weird if a film about Iron Man as a hero ended with yeah that song or yeah, started with that. Because Iron Man in the song is the bizarre villain who's like wants to take over the world and yeah. destroy everything. Yeah, I um I thought I would enjoy the music in A Sound of Metal more than I did. I went into that thinking, and I bet I'm mean, gonna love the music. One, you hardly hear the music. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of music that they actually play and two it's also like kind of power violence crust punk which isn't really my kind of thing so i thought it was going to be like, it's not really metal it all kind of comes from punk so i was kind of annoyed and like the little subgenre nerd but then me was like yeah that's not actually it's not a metal it's not actually metal Did you uh, say crust punk crust punk yeah what do I mean? it's just crusty genre of punk <laughs> there's nothing more to it it's just punk and it's got crusty or grungy grimy i feel yeah, I never yeah. saw that film, to be honest. I, I thought there would have been more music, but I suppose in a film about someone that's losing their hearing, like... But check out these wicked yeah. tunes. <laughs> it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit inappropriate. Yeah, it, it, it's about, like, the silence in that film is more important than the music. Yeah. I recently, um, I recently watched a film a couple of days ago uh, on Netflix called The Lords of Metal, and that's the sort of... Oh, with the teenagers. Yeah, it's not very good. It's fine. But it's very much aimed at me because it's a 
it's a kind of high school rom-com about these two guys who are in a band and one of them's really confident and loves metal and the other one's just kind of awkward but gravitates to his sort of confidence and then he's into this girl and it's all it's all very naff and they're in a band together they could play a battle of the bands against the pop band and they don't get recognized because they're in a band called skull yeah. and it's all a bit um it's fine it's a bit all over the place well. but the music throughout as a metal fan i knew all of it but i never thought I don't know. I'll come away from those that film thinking. When I hear "Blood and Thunder" by Mastodon, I think of that film. Mm. I just, it's just a nice little hey. And then at the end, it has a bunch of cameo appearances by famous figures in metal. And I'm like, hey, I know them. It was, it was rubbish, but it was entirely designed for me. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They know what you like. Yeah. Also, I was going to say, like, more onto animated films. We said this, yes. Shrek. Oh, yeah. Shrek's fan music is fantastic. Soundtrack. The the first one where he just boots the door in, all stars <laughs> rocking. So <laughs> body wants to tell me. <laughs> so good. Yeah, all the way through is. is um, love the and then in the second one, uh, accidentally in love by Counting Crows is yeah. a big tune. And then there's also a bunch of numbers in it. There's a bunch yeah. of like big. They do a big number. Um, the fairy godmother comes in. She sings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I need a hero by Bonnie yeah. Tyler plays. Um, and then uh, Living a Vida Loca by uh, Ricky Martin is played, but like performed by them. Yeah, it's all it's Can all very it. stupid, but it's great fun. One that I have always appreciated is um, the immigrant song version in like the third one, where Snow White starts. She comes in and she's like singing all sweetly, all. and then she turns and starts singing Led Zeppelin, yeah. and it's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes from those movies. Yeah, the Shrek films always have good music to go with them are they making more shreks they're more shreks they're they're shrek. some boot now aren't they yeah. put some oh. boot put some boots Puss in yeah. boots yeah. he has two boots he has two legs four legs actually well, oh yeah, yeah. four legs oh. Three so legs. Have four two. boots have four boots plot twist not plot twist <laughs> plot hole <laughs> don't they wear gloves at one point I don't know it's, it's an animated cat he also yeah. rides a horse and can talk so let's not think yeah. about it too much my cat's Where's in um, can you ride horse <laughs> just I hear them in my mind <laughs> <laughs> a telepathic, you know. Um, I think one of my favorite sort of weird pop culture moments of music is in Ace Ventura when, as it's before, but when uh, he goes to some show and it's just, on the stage, it's just Cannibal Corpse, like original lineup Cannibal Corpse, just doing Hammer Smashed Face, and it's like it's so dumb. And he and Jim Carrey's been very vocal about how much he loves death metal and how he relates to community and stuff so he's friends a lot of people in it but they're just in it and they're just doing a show and it's just it's the most bizarre sort of like cultural crossover moment there's a jim carrey movie about him being a pet detective and one of the biggest and at the time most controversial death metal bands together it's bizarre mm. but i love it together tenet yeah everything's connected nice yeah, yeah, tenet it, it always comes it, 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 it always, always, always comes back. full yeah. circle exactly <laughs> You <laughs> missed your fingers again. Um, yeah, I was also going to say, Into the Spider Verse. Oh yeah, I really love. If you say Sunflower by Post Malone, I'm gonna. I really you. love. I really love. Oh, that song is so irritating. I love that song, lots and lots actually. It's I great. like the use of it in mm. the film. When it came out, along with the film, it was really overplayed. And it kind of, before I'd seen the film, I had heard the song a million times and it kind of sucked all the joy out of it. And then when I watched the film, I was like, oh, this is such a nice thing to go with the film. It fits really well with the yeah. film where he's just like yeah. swinging. It works really well. Yeah, because it's, like, it's not like played loads in the film. It's just he yeah. has it in his ears and then he's walking down the street and yeah. then it's sort of just it, plays it in the It suits the mood and the yeah, scene I agree with that. very well. And I think the whole... Like the film does that really well, actually, into mm. the Spider Verse. It, it it's quite well chosen. The yeah. best mm. piece of film music, though, the best song written for a film. I don't mean like a score. I mean like a song. Will always be in my mind. My heart will go on by Celine Dion from Titanic. James Horner okay. wrote such an incredible score for that film. Say what you want about that film. It's too long. Why do they get back on the boat? A lot of the decisions in that film don't make a lot of sense. It's kind of pointless, but the music is so good. And then it ends with this massive tune that I imagine if you were around in the mid 90s, late 90s, it was just punishing to hear it yeah. all the time. Do you remember when Sh um, Shallow and uh, 
Oh, thingy yeah. came out, the great sh- uh, not Great Showman, um, but also The Greatest mm. Showman as well. Yeah, Star yeah. is Born. Star is Born. Those songs were unavoidable. They were mm. just every single day you would hear them. But actually, both those films have decent soundtracks. Um, that was actually quite a nice song if you listen to it yeah. once ever so often. It's but I can't have it played no, every day. It and it fits really well in the much. film as well. Yeah, it was way too much. But the Celine Dion is the best of it because then her, later on, she did the soundtrack to Deadpool 2 with Ashes, which is also a surprisingly so good. It's surprising. Good song. It shouldn't be as no. good as it is. And I remember reading a review of the single and someone was like, the, how stupid, the, the fact that this is a sequel, stupid sequel to a stupid film anyway, and the song is this good, yeah. feels almost insulting to the song. It's a really good song. Also, uh, what's the one? And I Will Always Love You, that that song. Oh, uh, The Bodyguard, the Bodyguard. Whitney Houston. Can't stand that. Why not, man? Because I hate the bodyguard. Yeah, but we already know that you don't like Baby Driver, but you like some of the songs from it. I like the songs in Baby Driver before I saw Baby Driver. I don't like that film. I don't like the music in that film. I don't really... I didn't really feel like... When you said earlier the music helps, I didn't really feel that at all. I just felt that film was a bit pointless. Um, I'm just going to quickly take it back a step to Deadpool. Because I was thinking about this and I had a feeling you were going to bring up that opening song. But as a kind of bit of Deadpool 2 where I always think this is a weird soundtrack moment but I kind of like it is the Juggernaut scene with Colossus and Juggernaut fighting and it's this really weird chorusy what should be like a really interesting soundtrack and it's just like a load of um, swearing but like it's the Juggernaut and it's really funny and if you listen closely it's it's hilarious and i always think what a weird soundtrack moment yeah yeah i feel like they had such fun just doing whatever they wanted with oh, that yeah. in, in general they was like oh celine dion yeah oh, yeah we'll do yeah. that song this one whatever yeah. just do whatever yeah. such a funny moment mm. but on the theme of superheroes more recently more modern joker and batman original scores well some of it in there I love the new Batman. The new Batman. The, the Batman. 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 Yeah. yeah. I love the music in those. I think it's so great. I know, like, you guys said that you've kind of forgot about it. Yeah, well, when but, you said like, it, the Joker I have, but not the Batman. The Batman's music. Like, I think um, Something in the Way is one of Nirvana's best tunes. Mm. It's kind of been done to death now since that film came out, so I've got to take a pause on it. But going into that film, that was easily one of my favorite Nirvana tunes. Mm. And then it fits so well with the super moody emo theme of that film. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But Joker, I remember seeing Joker and being like, oh, wow, this is insane. And like I said to you before, like the scene where he goes into the bathroom, he starts dancing and... Uh, similarly to that later on when he's waiting to go on to that show mm. and the, all the surround sounds like just fades out and he hears that again or well, he doesn't hear it but you hear it and he's doing his little dance again I think that's such like a great moment and I'm, I remember watching an interview with the woman that started to write the music she, her first instrument that she knows is um, cello Bass, jelly, bass. One of the one big violins. One of those are massive <laughs> ones. Yeah. And uh, double bass. She said that sh- her th- first thing was she sat down and started playing that, and one of the first songs on the soundtrack is literally just the, the cello and that first scene where it comes into him and he's like smiling and crying in the mirror and stuff was apparently well. I don't know if it's true. This is what I've read. This is what I've heard is him listening to it for the first time. So like. Obviously, they've laid over the soundtrack, but like, yeah. I think that's a really nice correlation. Because yeah, cool. when when you said when we were talking about doing this one, and you were like, "Oh yeah, the Joker," I, like when I first, when I watched it, I didn't. Like, yeah, I, I couldn't. Didn't, I, I didn't notice. conjure any no, music exa- to my no, head. Exactly, but then you showed us the dancing. And I was like, "Oh yeah, I like, do remember that." Yeah. But yeah, okay, yeah. So maybe I'll have to. I think I was just so focused on watching the yeah. film because I was like, "This mm. is going to be so weird." But I also think, yeah, like if I if if I if it just came on, I was just hanging out and that someone I put a playlist on that song came on. I think in my brain would have been like, oh, it feels like the Joker, mm-hmm. and would have looked at it and gone, oh yeah, it is. But like, if you say the music in the Joker, I don't immediately sum it to my mind. The same with uh, the music in Prisoners, as I said earlier, Johan Johansson's music. But I don't mm-hmm. remember thinking about that. But then I hear the music and I'm like, oh yeah, no, I 100 percent can hear this in the film. 
Yeah. Um, but I think that's the important thing is that if you, like we said earlier, if you haven't heard the music prior to the film, you will then associate it with the film forevermore. Like I had never heard the Pixies, whereas my mind before I watched Fight Club, so I was then like, now it's always Fight Club song. Whereas my dad was always like, no, 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 no. I knew this. I, this was a Pixies hit. Like this, yeah. I knew this before Fight Club came out. And I'm like, okay, cool, so indie, all right. But like, um, the Drive soundtrack is will forever just be iconic. I got a big neon pink vinyl. I love it. Um, and it's those songs, Real Hero, um, uh, Night Cool. Oh, those early tunes, like the, the sort of found songs and that are so good, but I'd never heard them no. beforehand. And now those, so they always tie into the tone and feel of that film. And I love it. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, both of those, I had just like no idea they were even things. And yeah. then in that film, it's like, oh my God, these are actually amazing. It's so good. But it's what I really hate about, and I've said this before, but I really hate um, music biopics because no one goes to music biopic to find new music, to hear, you don't generate new relationships with that music. No one who watched Bohemian Rhapsody generated a new relationship with the song Bohemian Rhapsody having watched the film Bohemian Rhapsody. You go into it and then you're just hearing the song that you already know played through a decent sound system and a bunch of people doing an organized dance. And it's like you might as well just go on YouTube and just search Queen Live 4K and then put it through your good speakers and then you, you save you the cinema ticket. Yeah, also like... Film biopics are weird because if uh, like the Elvis one, it's the, the it's the actors. It's Austin Butler it, singing, right? which I really don't no, like. No, I, I if I wanted to listen to Elvis songs, I'd listen to Elvis. If he's doing he's doing an impersonation. Karen in Rocket Man. Yeah, yeah, and I hate that. Yeah, it shouldn't yeah, be. It should I be think Elvis. Most of them, right? Or like, most biopics. It's like oh, I'm trying to sound as close as possible to no, just mime it. Yeah, just play Elton John. <laughs> yeah, and there's Why enough live I footage. I heard that Elton John wanted. The person to sing. I don't care what Elton no. John wants. He doesn't know what he, he doesn't know <laughs> what makes a good film. film. He's not a filmmaker. Though, and that film's <laughs> awful. So, yeah, you know, live and learn. You made the wrong choice. Yeah, but then also, also yeah, also the the Johnny Cash one as well. Yeah, um, like, Wacky and yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah, he's fine singing it, but if I want to listen to Johnny Cash, yeah. I'm gonna listen to Johnny Cash. I don't, I don't I just listen to uh, Wacky and Phoenix. There's doing become a this Cash trend versus. among um, biopics to go. Oh, we need to get a big performance and get it identical to how it was in real life. And I don't know who's asking for that because it's always the worst bit of those films and they treat it like a big action set piece and it's rubbish. Yeah. But I've spoken enough on this podcast yeah, we'll, about yeah, we'll, <laughs> biopics. <laughs> you might need to do just like a biopic show. And it would just be me in this chair for an hour just yelling yeah. at the camera. Straight down the lens. We're just and another <laughs> thing! <laughs> We just leave. Yeah. Cameron yeah. could just Cameron keep going. Cameron doesn't need us to do Just come this. back off the weekend. I'm still here, just <laughs> still yelling. And then I watch Ray. <laughs> yeah, that they have weird ones, but great showman. I love it. Like fine, and that's great. and that's something that that the, all that music's written for that film. Mm. Um, incidentally, the best song in that film is the last one uh, from now on. That's yeah. the best song yeah. in that film. That is the best. Song. Um, good. Glad we're glad we were able to come to this agreement. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, I think, th I think that you know, it's about generating new music, but ge but it's so much harder to get. It's like can't someone to come to a new IP, right? Mm. It's like, how do you sell someone to come and see Avatar or your new science fiction franchise when it's so much easier to get everyone to go and watch Star Trek, Star Wars, Lord yeah. of the Rings? The on Star Trek. Have you seen Star Trek? I have seen Star Trek. They have weird. Me That's the Wait, which, the new ones of the old ones. films. The, new, the new films. Okay, right. Sure. They have Don't what you were saying about like no, what you were saying about like fifties music when it was like whoop, 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 when it sounds super weird. Yeah, that's what it has in that film. I don't remember that at all. And then you occasionally hear like a weird sort of space sound. Mm. That's a weird one because they could have done something so great with it as well. Yeah, you're in space, so much options. You're in a big spaceship. One yeah. of the things I'm really ready to end in music was came from Inception, particularly the trailer, which wasn't actually done by Hans Zimmer, controversially. It was done by a guy called Zach Hemsey. Um, oh, yeah. Zach Hemsey did... did uh, stuff in Equalizer. Sure. But he did the music... He did the song Mind Heist, right? That whole thing. I'm sick of that. Get rid of the... Everyone yeah, does it. It's in too much stuff. I don't... It that was in everything. I'm for so tired years, of it. Just the the horns. 
Yeah. It's also, it's SpongeBob's alarm clock. It's all I ever oh, think about yeah. when I hear it. And it's like, it's not, it's this big foghorn and everyone's like, oh, it's the Inception song. No, it's SpongeBob's alarm clock. Yeah. Which is why I like so much uh, the Interstellar soundtrack is that they did um, something very different. They did it all on an organ. It's all on an organ and piano. Mm. And uh, incidentally, Hansen was talking about that and he was saying that um, the reason they chose an organ because that film was very much about humans. The film's not about space travel. That film's about um, people, right? Mm. And uh, there's in that sort of conversation when he reads the messages from his uh, his children, that's the sort of soul of that film. And an organ is still a wind instrument. It has to have air pass through it. So an organ has to almost take a breath. So you hear the organ breathe almost like it's a person. But they were also saying that in the 18th century, the organ was the most complicated piece of human engineering in the world. And it, then the film is also about the most complicated piece of human engineering. Yeah. It's that kind of very Nolan deconstructionist way of doing things. Yeah. I, yeah. I never think that deeply about. No, but we music. don't. No, but I'm but they do. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's what why he Nolan and Hans Zimmer do together. And that's why they, that's why they make the big bucks. That's why he works with Batman. We work in a basement. <laughs> yes. A nice basement though. With friends. With friends. I bet they don't have any friends. I bet they do. Playing yeah, the other. organ all day. <laughs> no one likes people that play organs. Uh, right, well, should we do like a wrap-up final thoughts, music, or do you have anything else that you want to bring up? Do you want to do like three best scores? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, best score? Best three. soundtracks, best scores, either, Be- favorite anything. Favorite songs. Okay. Favorite moments. I've got one. Go I got, on. I, w- I do like my favorite scores, not film scores, songs from Okay, films. sure. You lead and I'll follow whatever you do. Um... The Reverend main theme tune. The Reverend? Yes. Okay. I love that one. It's by a Japanese composer, I think. So good. Love it. It's kind of like time. It builds up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, can, I know it. I just can't. I don't know um, it. And then obviously time. Um, and then uh, he's a pirate. What's that? He's a pirate. Oh, he's a pirate. Cla- that's Klaus Badal, actually. That's not... Um, there we go. That's a new one. Hans Zimmer. But yeah. Look at me. Knowing stuff. Um... I'd probably say uh, Love Pledge in the Arena from Star Wars Episode 2, which is a mental one because it's got the big love theme in it, but it's got yeah. which I love. Yeah, um, Second half of that, great love. I'd say um, uh, The King of the Golden Hall from the Two Towers, which is uh, the Rohan theme. Okay. And then the last one would be actually David Jones's theme from Pascal, oh, yeah. which is Hans Zimmer. Uh, again, it's an organ. I love the sound of an organ. Mm. Um, and it's actually all, all of that. Is that all, a slow one? Yeah, what did but that it builds. Like? What did that sound like the other day? Uh, the Suspiria theme. There we go. I was about to oh, sorry. S- start with... Over to you. The Suspiria theme. From or the, the David Jones theme, whichever one you want to choose. Yeah. Well, sorry. Suspiria came first. Sorry. It did, it did. Suspiria. I don't know. Parts of the Caribbean set in like 1750. Uh, actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, from the original, Suspiria. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> mine's just gone completely blank. I just had some in my brain, and now they're gone. I don't know. Should we just say films, and it might pop into your head? No. Frozen. No, that sounds like such a bad idea. Not helpful. While Race is thinking, incidentally, with uh, um, David Jones' theme, he plays that sort of opening bit that's the Suspiria theme, and as he goes, Dun-dun-dun, which is a direct reference to Captain Nemo playing his organ above aboard the Nautilus in the old, uh, was it 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea film? Is that how many leagues they're under? I don't know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, but the guy who plays Captain Nemo, he plays an organ on his ship, so the idea of having an organ on a ship is a direct reference. Oh, okay. And that's Takata and Fugue by... Bark, and they've just copied, they've just transposed it entirely yeah. and put it in because they're just going, We like that film, we want to tell you about it. But I actually think it fits the theme really well. It does, that's a nice bit. No, I've forgotten, so we can really? just move on. So, away. Suspiria and nothing well, else. No, there were some. Fight Club. Confuse me. No, club. it's not Fight Club. I love the Pixies, but no. The Joker. Oh, yeah, bathroom scene. Bathroom dance, that's what it's called. I think we should have just Joker. started reading all the yeah. films. It worked. And I don't Star think Wars. I really had it. <laughs> Avatar. Definitely not either of those. Damn it. No. Um, I don't think I really had a third. There are just yeah. like certain yeah. moments. Like just I say think. concerning hobbits, not make me really happy, no. and then we'll be good. Never. <laughs> do it. I refuse. That is a bop, though. It is that a bop. Is a, that is actually a great one. If you had heard, if, yeah, have you I heard think, it, yeah, I think. No. We should play there it. Just <laughs> certain uh, songs, I think, in certain scenes. I'm like, oh, wow. This mm. works so well. But interestingly, yeah. I think if we play, you and I both love that score, and everyone I know who's our age loves it right yet 
I don't think Grace, I think Grace to Hero and go, yeah, and whatever. Yeah, because maybe. it's all about the connotation. It's yeah. all about, I remember being four, five, six years old, first time I saw that film, and the, the wagon driving through and Gandalf and Frodo yeah. talking about Bilbo's birthday. Like all of those memories there, yeah. come forward. Whereas Grace just hears a guy playing the pan pipes. Yeah. Doo-doo. Really underselling it. Let's not play it to you. <laughs> Ever. Let's not. You need to watch the film before you play it. No thanks. Right, so you're Suspiria and the bathroom scene in the Joker. Mm-hmm. It, what is that what it's called? It's called Bathroom Dance, I think. Oh, is it? Amazing. Um, what was yours? Can't remember. Cool. <laughs> Mine was... Can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I, I, mine's probably not my top three. It was just three yeah. I could think of at the Lord time. Lord of the Rings definitely wasn't. Uh, yeah, Lord of the Rings. Was star, yeah, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars yeah. and Pirates of the Caribbean, which... Yeah. There's no way I've got so those good. two in my top three. I feel like you sort of jumped on my shit with the parts of the camera. Yeah, yeah, you get it? But fine, I don't mind. But maybe you both jumped on mine with Suspiria, but you mm. forgot about it until no, I, I said Suspiria it the other day. So. Anyway. anyway. That's a good point. Yeah, okay, anyway, that's our music chat. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, yeah, music is great, and I like listening to it through my ear holes. <laughs>